You know, I did some research. Uh, I was writing a, a play about uh, Ishii, the, the wild, the last wild man in California or something. And he was, Krober was studying him. And uh, this was in 1911 to 14 or somewhere that he came out in Orville. And they took him to Berkeley and they studied him. And he was he lived the old ways, he did everything. He wasn't civilized, they say. But he is, he said some things that I remember when he said that. He said that uh he said that uh why do the white men kill people? Kill kill like Jesus, baby Jesus. Why did they want to kill baby Jesus? Baby Jesus just baby Jesus, just a baby, but the uh, they want to kill him. They look for him. They never find baby Jesus. But Jesus, baby Jesus go on and he grew up. He big he grew up big, he came back. Baby Jesus became a man. Jesus good doctor. He made the people see. He said to went to a dead man, say, get up, and he gets up. He made the blind man see, touch him. See, you can see. He did all these things. And why did they kill him? Why? But if Jesus came to us, we take care of him. He's a good man. But why do the white people kill him? He said, why do people kill him? Why? Well, in the story, they say that it's because the Pharisees were making a lot of money and uh, things, selling uh, doves to make money, and then when he kicked over that table and all that stuff. I mean, they were all made money, and they were using that power of religion to control, too, to some degree. And they had a place in uh, the government. They didn't want to lose that. And he came along and said, no, this is not the way you do it. So he was a threat to their own things they were doing. So... And it finally ended up he got killed over that. I think he mentioned that he walked on water, too. He said he raised and he came back from the dead. And he, he said a lot of good things about him. He, to him, it was, it was stupid that they killed him, you know? Flocks of snowbirds came to Southern California by train to what was then regarded as a sort of heaven on earth. They had come from congested and polluted places like Chicago and Detroit, disembarking in Pasadena to the Green Hotel. And they instigated and demonstrated the mobility of the era, recognizing the sanctity of the environment due to their ability to move about. My mother and father arrived in Pasadena in 1936, but post-war industrialization brought to this land of purple mountains, orange groves, and the Rose Parade. Smog. Caltech scientists discovered it the year I was born. That's why my lungs hurt as a child, because of the hydrocarbons. When I was born, my mom said, I'm taking him to the desert, where the air is clean. Trips to the desert were usually made in the spring, down Foothill Boulevard wrapping around the San Bernardinos and over the Cajon Pass. Foothill was special. It was the last segment of Route 66 heading into LA, so it stood to reason this was the way out. If Pasadena was becoming Detroit, we would keep moving. And as the road cut through the broad plains, you felt the tremendous space all around you. The country rolling out to the horizon, and you rolling with it. After World War II, returning GIs witnessed consumer democratization. With automobiles now the preferred way of travel, the motel provided affordability on the road, and Foothill was a parade of motel wonders. The road, like river water, was running under you. But we would head to 29 Palms, where the inn beckoned. You sort of sense the real meaning behind the word freedom. Speed was the temptress. You could see her in your mind's eye, a siren coaxing you to open the throttle, burn up the road. We then inhabited a world with only a limited understanding of our climate.
money comes from the snake's blood, and the snake's blood is powerful. Nobody knows how to use it. We had people like Goldman Sachs uh, had more leases uh, on BLM land than anybody else. What's 30% of $2 billion? That's $600 million up front as a cash grant. We also have environmental groups, NRDC is a good example, saying climate change trumps land conservation. To the extent that we're doing large-scale renewable projects in the desert, that's also causing some significant harm. I think we're at a point in our history where it isn't just about you know, one issue, it's about where do we go with our taking care of the earth. This is a great day for California, and especially San Diego and Imperial counties. Renewable energy starting to find its way into our state, into our counties. On this site, Bright Source Energy commenced construction of the Ivanpah Solar Electric Generating System. Well, there in our lives, we were born and raised here in Blythe, and we always knew about about the uh, Temuk. We always knew about our indigenous background. The transformational project serves as a cornerstone of California's and the nation's burgeoning clean energy economy. We always knew that how they had mistreated us. As being a descendant of Joaquin Murrieta, we always knew the story of Joaquin Murrieta. We knew how the Anglo-Saxon United States had come and stolen our lands. They raped our women and they stole our mines. The gasping constriction of airflow into capillaries filled with soot and hydrocarbon that brought me more than once to my knees with dry heaves ceased. The grounds of the inn included the oasis of Mara, a natural desert feature. Among the desolation, among the nothingness and solitude, here the magic began. In a rough land of gnarled Joshua trees and jumping cactus, here was home to the Chemuevi, who arrived following a war with the competing Mojave along the Colorado River. From the old Chemuevi burial ground, the oasis can be seen as an isolated refuge where water rises through fractured rock, a sacred site. I could look out from the cinder block cabins to the east toward the mountains and moments feel an inescapable pull. How are you guys doing today? Doing fine. So is the governor here yet? Uh, I have no idea. You see his helicopter? I, don't, I didn't know he had one, sir. Well, like we were prepared. So we, we knew that we were uh, an abused people. There's some people that look out in the desert and they see miles and miles of emptiness. Did he come in this morning? Did he come in with his Hummer or he's coming in with a helicopter? I don't know, sir. So how many people are here? Couldn't tell you. I don't know, sir. I see miles and miles of a gold mine. What do you think the Native American people feel about this? I don't know, sir. Are you Native American? No, sir, I'm not. Okay. Get out of the way. I am a photographer and a documentary filmmaker. As a filmmaker, I began to make films with and among Native communities working with Native Americans to restore the environment. But here I found these two dimensions of my existence to be in deep conflict. Despite our ongoing efforts, the BLM failed to engage in meaningful consultation as required, not only by Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, but also as required by other federal laws and policies. Viejas and almost all Southern California tribal governments have stated very clearly that we do not oppose alternative renewable energy development so long as those projects are compliant with federal law and policy and so long as those projects are not at the expense of our cultural identity. By 2013, several large-scale renewable energy projects had been permitted, some near 10,000 acres in size. Overall, over 19 million acres are up for lease. Uh, we're going to be running to the solar site where we'll end in prayer. We're going to start in prayer right here, right now. So, uh, to recognize to the public, K, that, uh, you know, call your senators, call your governors. We stopped building nuclear plants. Uh, we stopped building coal plants. 
uh, and began to rely on natural gas cogeneration, combined heat and power, along with wind, solar, and geothermal plants. Uh, the solar plants were first built uh, out in uh, an area of the Mojave Desert called Kramer Junction. The significance of Kramer Junction and that area of the desert is the fact that it has the highest solar radiation of almost any place in the world. We want solar power, but we don't want it on pristine desert floor. You know, there's, anybody who looks at the desert, they say, oh, it's just a desert. It's not. Uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of animals out here that uh, need to be protected. You know, that, uh, and nobody's their voice. All right, come on, let's go. Well, Ivan Paw sits in the larger Mojave Desert ecosystem. Uh, and it, this is a renowned area of 25 million acres in size, roughly, uh, uh, known by scientists throughout the world for uh, being one of, the, one of the last intact ecosystems uh, left in the desert southwest, certainly, if not North America as a whole. I'm, I'm a botanist and I study the plants in the, in the, in the California deserts and, and Nevada deserts. Um, and what has really struck me by this area is the level at which we are, are just scratching the surface in terms of documenting uh, the flora. Uh, you can assume uh, uh, roughly about 5 to 10 percent of the species out there remain undescribed to date. We're going to go pick him up and Ken is going to he, he's going to drive, then Ken's going to run a mile, and then uh, Ron will drive the mile, and then at the mile, they'll switch and keep going that way. Kramer Junction uh, has been running now for 25 years, and during that time, uh, there has been an enormous amount of knowledge gained from the operation and the fine-tuning and the replacement of the mirrors, the ad addition of new technology. And if you talk to solar engineers from around the world, Kramer Junction is like a shrine. I busted my ankle, so that's my excuse. <laughs> if you go into Death Valley and, and you look at the tourism there from, from Europe and their deep appreciation for not only the biodiversity, but this vast sort of open space that somewhere deep in our human spirit is necessary. It's not just about ecosystem function, it's about a deep appreciation. We have this slowly building constituencies, the utilities are agreeable if they've got to do renewable energy, well, let's do it big and remote. That's the way we like to do our systems anyway. Plus, we make our best money on building transmission lines. There was a, a lot of leases that were issued by the BLM or that were received by the BLM. And the Bush administration, which had been very aggressive about building uh, uh, oil and gas uh, leases or allowing oil and gas leases of fossil fuels, uh, had the sort of same mindset about solar. Let's just see how much we can lease. And then, out of the blue, the cost of doing these photovoltaic panels on the roof or on the ground drops precipitously. We've learned a lot, we've made a lot of mistakes, uh, but we are now poised uh, to have a revival and a significant buildup. This scale of an impact has never occurred before. Once it reached about 250 proposed projects, from 5 to 25,000 acres each, totaling 2 million acres just for California, I decided to do a, a quick and dirty analysis of how many acres of public lands have been mined since the passage of the 1872 Mining Act. We will exceed that total number of acres in three to five years if all these proposed projects were to go through. The importance of these systems to provide corridors for species to move as climate changes, whether it's human-caused change or just the natural course of variation in climate change, um, you've, you've really done in the entire ecosystem at that, at that scale. I had first been brought to the desert by my father and mother, members of the greatest generation. 
attempting to heal from the horror of mechanized destruction. But to my horror, mechanized destruction followed. Despite concerns about native culture and the environment, the California Energy Commission, acknowledging the need to cool a dangerously warming planet, approved numerous renewable energy projects that they acknowledge would destroy over 17,000 Native American cultural sites. When you hear me pray, you'll hear us say uh, avimpa, and avimpa in Chimwebi is, is uh, white clay water, and uh, that's where the word Ivan Paul comes from, avimpa. What we're going to do is uh, we're just going to thank the runners uh, uh, for bringing the prayers with the running and, and a lot of be people's tribes on the river and, and out in the desert area and, and all the west. Uh, running is a very sacred thing and, and uh, it carries prayers with them and, and we appreciate the young people doing that. In our ways, when, when things were created, they were created for the people uh, specifically and that when you know animals died and, and or became and when they were people, when they became animals that people would use, it was for the people and the plants, they gave themselves for the people too. And, and uh, we just respect that, you know, and, and uh, try to keep that to alive and keep that together. Now here's the, here's the minute. So you will notice. Oh, it's a line. Look at that line. line. Black See? on one side. Black on one side and blonde on the other side. Yeah. The blonde represents what? It represents Heaven. male. The dark side where we're stepping on, we're stepping on what is, represents Mother Earth. Represents the woman. Represents night. So I wonder if there are pentacles right somewhere. Yeah. No, what it is is a, like an altar something. As a young man, I didn't know all this. Gradually, that's why we say loke na wake, like the fingers in the hand. Among all, we do all for the benefit of all. Different sizes, different shapes, all together in the trunk of the human race. Represents so the cosmos that's why I started participating more. Here we see this arrow, this night. And this arrow is pointing straight to where this, that mountain is right there. See that mountain is? What is the name of that mountain? Clark, Clark Mountain. It's Clark Mountain? There's okay. hot springs in there. There's some hot springs there. Okay. So everywhere that we have these sacred sites, this is hydrology. But you all have to understand, quartz represents the male. Dark represents the female. This is Chiss. This is Chiss. I'm a miner. Oh, excellent. excellent. No, I gotta, we gotta let the people know. Otherwise, what are we gonna do? It's just gonna be, they're gonna destroy. And then, there's all, you know, like I said, uh, before we were worried about the, the off roaders and now, you know? Yeah. Now, it's, now it's total destruction. I have solar panels. I did that before a long time ago. When I first moved to the reservation and I didn't have a house, so we built a house and we had no electricity. It's too far away to get electricity. It cost too much, so we got solar panels and we used solar panels for a while. And it worked for us. I think if they're going to do that, they should make it available to people to put on their uh, roofs to make, to supplement their uh, electricity, their power the source. I think it should be done like that, yeah. I met Alfredo Figueroa at the Blythe Airport at 7 o'clock in the morning. He had arranged for me to fly over the desert, where Solar Millennium wanted to construct the largest solar energy plant in the world. Ten of them. They were all together. There was a group of them. So we knew a lot of stories, but we didn't have all these facts. We just knew about our sites, our sacred sites that were here. Um, of the giant and taglos, you know, I became a little older and I started reading the books. But we know that the Creator is everywhere. He who has no names has all the names. But here he has the name Ometeo, and he recites in Ome Yokan. Ome means to your for your lot. Your lot means your heart. It's often my heart. So the heart, the place of the two hearts is Ome Yokan, where Ome Theo recites. The image represents the male, Ome Tekutli. The female, Ome Siwa. Papago, Opota, 
Yaki, Chimaweve, and the two spiritual images are Ome Siwat and Ome Tekuti for the creator image of Ome Teo. In our tradition, we include the woman, and in the other tradition, that and the religion, they don't include the woman. And we do because we know there's a Mother Earth. We're standing on Mother Earth and we're the guardians of Mother Earth. What I saw across this landscape, close to the Blythe and Taglios, was hundreds of shapes, patterns, and images signifying importance by the sheer weight of the rock moved alone. A lot of people ask why BLM is doing all of these renewable energy projects and um, why we're not managing the land for other things, why we're focusing so much effort on these projects. And the reason is because we get applications from companies to use BLM land for these projects. And so we're obligated to process the applications. So they call them intaglos because they're an imprint on the surface of the ground. So they remove big uh, black rocks on top, on the hard mesa surface, and they reveal the white caliche. Caliche is like limestone, so it's white. So you can see uh, the images, and they place the, the rocks that they removed, they placed them on the side to outline the image that they were trying to portray. So that's what intaglo means. It's a word that, like I said, it was applied, but the, the, the scientific word is geoglyph. California deserts have vast stores of carbon held as inorganic caliche, calcium carbonate. Worldwide, caliche deposits hold about as much carbon as the entire Earth's atmosphere. Under the beautiful and ancient geoglyphs is one of the world's richest carbon storage banks. Here we are standing right there in the sacred site of CC Meat and Coco Pili. Coco in Nahuatl means hurt. Pili means our Lord. Coco Pili is hurt. And this is the site where the Blythe Solar Panel projects are proposed to be built. How many panels are going to be put there? <laughs> Who knows? how many panels there are going to be. It's going to be a complete disaster. Kokopili in Nahuatl also means Quetzalcoatl. That's the image of the Creator, but when he's leaving here in this earth during the, the third sun in the Aztec calendar. My indigenous name is Yakoyot Mexica. And uh, most people know me as Jim Guerra. And most of my work has been in community planning and research. So the sacred site is not a specific spot, even though you may find an intaglo in a specific spot. It's a continuum of land use and history and tribal tradition. It's a constant battle to come to defend your, your history and your ancient sites and your sacred sites and your land. The reason that we're here is we want to know what your concerns are with this project, ways that we can modify it, mitigation measures. Yes? Are you BLMR? BLM Realtors? I am not a realtor now. It's an educational process. A lot of people misunderstand Indian people, for one thing. They, they think we're a closed society, that we don't want interaction, that, that they can't come and share things. And for us, that's the only the way that they will learn is to come and learn from us. We've run across this issue before where people come out and they decide they want to do projects without any respect or concern for the traditional sacred sites. And that's the case now, even though it's going to be the largest solar project in the United States, they still have to respect our lands. I often use uh, contemporary locations. 
so that if, if a development wanted to go through a certain area and they say, well, it, they call it the area of potential effect, the APE, the APE. And they want to try and make that APE as small as possible so they can develop around it. And so I used the example of the Catholic Church. I want to build a pipeline through the Vatican Mall. Well, it's really not a part of the Vatican, so it's not sacred. And suddenly they're saying, well, no, you know, this whole area is sacred. And for Indian people, that's one of the things that we're constantly coming up against. When we look at not that little area, but we look at the total landscape, and especially in regards to the geoglyphs, there are hundreds of them, and they're probably over a stretch of hundreds of miles, and they all interconnect. It's not this little area here we're going to fence off and then move over 100 yards and there's another area. And it, they need to begin thinking about the total landscape that we see. Are the tribes part of the public? The tribes are part of the public, but we also have another process where we work with the tribes directly with the represented leaders of the tribe through the government-to-government -government consultation process. So, and that government-to-government -government consultation process actually started November in 2011 for this project. Yeah, what, what tribe were you talking about? You met uh, last November. I, I have Daughter. enough projects that I couldn't say which tribes went to which meetings, so I do not know. Do you, do Mark, no, you weren't here with them. Mark is um, with the applicant, and he is newer to the project than November 2011. So I don't think that there's anybody in this room. Holly has way too many projects. She's not going to remember who showed up to what meeting either. As a response to climate change, big environmental groups like the Sierra Club and NRDC agreed to support renewable energy development in the desert, regardless of the consequences. It fell to Alfredo's group. La Cuna de Atzlan, Sacred Sites Protection Circle, to take on the giants. The Departments of Interior and Energy and companies like Solar Millennium, Florida Power and Light, and Bright Source. The age of the intaglios, the creation of the intaglios, is somewhat unknown. Uh, we know that they are very ancient, and we know that, or at least we believe, that they're probably U.S. taken in origin. U.S. Taken Language Group is a very large group. This is the proposed dry solar panel project. It's 9,500 acres. They probably um, were created at different points in time. So they're not all one age. They're obviously not one size. And there's been some research as to their meaning, which, which we think is, is well documented. What do you think? It's pretty amazing. It's hard to understand how this could be, have been created. They certainly don't look like individual bulldozer tracks, but it's such a big scale. These are so big, that's a lot of work to move all this rock. It's pretty astounding. Most agencies feel that they can just buy their way through everything, and that's not true. You cannot replace a sacred site once you destroy it, especially the ones that giant antagonists or Cocopili. There was a deliberate attempt by the federal government to uh, stop people from speaking the language. It was played out most vividly in the Indian schools. Children would be brought to the schools such as Sherman Institute in Riverside, and they were not allowed to speak their language. Uh, another factor was that, they, that students there were from different tribes, so they didn't speak they couldn't understand uh, someone from another tribe, another language group, I should say. So you may have five or six or seven languages uh, being spoken in that school when they were allowed to do it. It was an intent of the, of the teaching process to um, deculturize them. So they were to become Christians, Protestants in this case, Catholic schools, it was different. There was a Catholic school in Banny called St. Boniface, which was similar. The focus of the Indian schools was to train Indians to be uh, common laborers. 
and the, the men, and the women were trained to be housekeepers. You need to have the cultural memory that's in the language and the history of the people, which is in the songs and the stories. Uh, quite literally, the song cycles, of which there are many, hundreds of, hundreds of songs, uh, tell about everything from the creation to the, the biotic community, what animals are here and what, what they're about and what birds are here and what foods are here to eat and where the trails are and um, all the ceremonial and religious materials and the games that are played, all of that is, all, everything is in the language. And when the language is gone, you, those things go with them. As Mojaves, we have a, a cremation and uh, they sing the bird song and we, we, um, we visit these sacred places in the afterlife all along the river and certain mountains and you know it hurt me to see these these two towers up there because it would uh, violate uh, part of our creation and the stories that are on the river and uh, the Mojaves and uh, all the Kachans and Kokopas and all the other people that would live here. The Department of Interior, the Bureau of Land Management is a part of the Department of Interior. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is part of the Department of Interior. And the number two at the Department of Interior is a former lobbyist for San Diego Gas and Electric and for Semper Energy. The Genesis Project will sell power to San Diego Gas and Electric. This man, David Hayes, was a registered lobbyist for sdg &E. This man shouldn't have been within a thousand miles of Washington. Like I said before, the creator is everybody. He who has no name has all the names. But the most popular name that he has has been Quetzalcoatl. Quetzal means precious and Coatl means snake. So that's why we call also Mixcoatl the Milky Way. Mixcoatl. So he descends from the Milky Way. That's why he's a coiled snake. The Milky Way is a coiled snake. And his duality here in Earth is the shell. That, that the, and when we call people to order, we have the shell and we call whoo. First of all, I want to thank uh, Creator for this special day. and. El Abuelito Arturo Figueroa, who is uh, continuing with the spirit of our ancestors and was able to, to work for this moment and bring us all together from the, from the four corners, from the four directions. La Cuna has an agreement with the Bureau of Land Management to consult on sacred sites and geoglyphs, but the agency wasn't exactly knocking. The Bureau of Land Management does have a memorandum of understanding with La Cuna de Aslan Sacred Sites Protection Council and they don't necessarily respect that. They should be consulting directly and first with this organization that has a memorandum of understanding but many times they try to sidetrack it or say we're going to talk to other tribes out of the area. Eagle feathers, condor feathers, Like I said before, we just did a, a spiritual run through this area. We stopped and prayed and we stopped the Genesis Project to honor those uh, graves that they dug up. And, you know, it's not uh, 10,000 years ago, it's today. There's been certain, certain events over time they have brought people from several languages and several political groups together into, in order to take some action. Um, and the Sherman Institute was one of those. The claims case was one of those when the Indians were suing the government for the loss of their lands. Such, a, such an organization is occurring today.
History becomes religion. You look at our own cultures, ancient and important architecture that is part of our political or religious history becomes sacred. We deem it a treasure and we put a name on it and we put, a, put rules out that no one can endanger that. If these are the burial sites, then the archaeologists ought to say so, I think. Right. And, and so far we haven't heard what the content of these sites are. You know, it's all kind of mysterious. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the locals have said that there are burials here. Right. Whether or not that's the Cairns, you know, we, we don't know. And Preston they, said he could feel the bones. Yeah. He felt he was in the area of death. Yeah. I said before, that once somebody lived there and you had a cremation there, you have to stay away from it until we're ready to go back and do one when the time comes. I can't tell you when that time is. I see. We can't tell you when that time is. We're getting into what seems to be the site here. You can see windrows of uh, places where the, the rocks have been raked away and regular patterns, regular paths about the same width. There are a series of cairns up along here that are every, uh, from four to eight feet regularly spaced along the high places on the, uh, on the old shoreline here, Lake Kuia. Okay, let's say I live right here, and if, if one of my members, someone died here, I would take it east at a certain distance, and I would cremate the body. I wouldn't take it to a cemetery. Just east of where we lived, where I would cremate it. I'd bust up everything we had and buried it. If there was a house we lived in, I'd burn it down, bust everything, destroy it. I'd go over there, and when we cremated the body, we'd also throw in things and bust it and bury it. And that's what you're finding out here. We're probably standing on a, a sort of the remnants of, an, of a Holocene fan delta complex that sort of fed into the lake or the lake sort of, you know, was waxing and waning into this area. Ancient Lake Kauea is a, it's, it's a unique lake for the desert, for the desert southwest in that it's, um, it wasn't climatically controlled um, in, in as far as its fluctuating lake levels. It was, um, it was more of a, a flood controlled lake, controlled by floods from the Colorado River and um, you know, adjacent you know, minor drainages. The people, you know, they also had to adapt to, um, you know, to that environment. And you know, in that case, they, they migrated back and forth with the, with the changes in the lake level. Part of unraveling that mystery of you know how people coped with with how people coped with changes in climate and and changes in um, 
physiographic locations where they lived. And to study those things, you know, you need areas like this. This is the map right here. That's where they're at right now, right here. On the, the, the damn loader over there. I was invited to come to Blythe, California to see the Blythe intaglios, giant figures visible from space. Hundreds of similar designs in the area are endangered, and they were and are endangered by an unrelenting cry from my environmentalist peers and friends for climate change solutions, including large-scale renewable energy solar plants. Are they turning it up right now? They're turning it up right now. You want to go over there? Let's go. Let's take our stick inside. Come on. Okay, let's go. But they're, they're doing this. Why? So they can get that fast track money. And that fast track stimulus money is uh, being uh, given to them by the companies, by, by Obama, because they're trying to, to say they were, we're helping the, the environment. You think they're helping the environment by destroying our second sites? Well, that's totally ridiculous. All the way from Abiquame down to the Gulf of California is where just the geoglyphs are. Geoglyphs are the designs on the surface of Earth where the creator made his first trek. And there's his first foot right there. See, all this is like a blackboard. That's the way it's supposed to look. Like if you come in an airplane, they look it's just like a blackboard. But when you make all these designs, like over there, you're gonna, I'm gonna take you away. Hey, don't go. So when uh, you're gonna see that, where they already destroyed part of it. See, see, meat. Meat means magnetic north. They're videotaping us. Yeah. What's that? They're videotaping us. Definitely they're videotaping us. No, no, our friends over here. Uh-huh. Let's see what they're saying. Okay. Come on over here. <laughs> don't tell me to come here. Don't tell me to come here. With the Cocopili geoglyph and many others facing the bulldozer, Lacuna's strategy of on-the-ground actions to slow construction and sow the seeds of doubt got a reaction quickly. But would they have a case? In a pre-trial hearing, the judge asked the Department of Interior's lawyers, how does the PEIS, the Programmatic Environmental Impact Statement, that is the rule book for solar in the West, account for the cumulative impacts to culture and the environment? That question remains unanswered. The complaint would proceed. We're gathered here today uh, because we're in a grave crisis. The biggest crisis that we've ever had this year today. Why? Because the government has decided to attack the creator. They have already destroyed part of our sites over here. And it pains me to come and see all this destruction without them paying any attention to us. So right now I just thought it would be nice if we just introduce ourselves. I'd like to just introduce first our good man here. This is Miguel Rosas from Yuma. Please, Miguel Rosas. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm here to protect uh, Mother Earth. Um, I know that these, these rocks, they're just rocks to other people, but these are sacred. And I believe that these rocks, they do speak to us. And they have saved us in the past. And they do have a message for us to save the future. But if we destroy, we destroy the evidence, we'll never know the message behind these sacred geoglyphs. We're standing right here where I, a long geoglyph it was around 50 feet long and around 5 feet wide. And it went straight through north. And it, why do I know it's straight through north? Because it goes all the way. And you come here at nighttime, you'll see right up there on top, <laughs> you'll see the North Star. And that North Star doesn't travel. It's no longer here. So all of it's gone. All of it's gone. How, how long was it? Around 50 feet long. Give and, or take. And we're right there now. We're right here. Right here. We're sitting right here. No more conversation. It's go, go, go. Sure, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley make out like a bandit on building this because we're throwing so much money at it. Don't you worry about that. They're on board with us. Climate change is number one. You're number two, or maybe you're number 10. It doesn't matter. We're moving. You saw over there where we were, had the, the signs, that was part of the sun. 
That's been destroyed forever too. This right here was destroyed, right here. and right across okay. the watch was destroyed too. Okay. Yes. This used to be the sun right here. Part of the sun. It got you know you, you see the the eastern part of the sun. That's why we know this the sun because the arrows are going towards the sun, and we know that the sun rises <laughs> at the east. They're so simple, and yet we think that they're so complicated because well for the Europeans it was complicated that's why they wanted to destroy everything it's framed as the great war against climate change but if they were really serious about it it would be focusing taking advantage of this photovoltaic revolution and maximizing the deployment of solar where it's most effective most cost effective but if you make that switch you are now going head to head against the investor owned utility model. Um, the blatant lack of respect and the fact there's a lawsuit actually in progress and they're just going ahead and plowing and devastating and ruining things is just unbelievable. And I think we know, all know we've hit a point where there's no return. So going green, ruining things to go green is completely a, an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense. We can't afford to ruin anything else. I always think about how the native people are, are their, their religious spirituality. I know I had a problem one time, a serious problem, and, and I couldn't control myself. I went to preachers, my brother-in-law, and some way preachers down in Parker preached their way, the Christian way. Get that out of me. Didn't work. Didn't work at all. And one day I just thought to myself, I says, I need to go to our own areas. And there's an area they call it the birthing rock. As you go through it, you're reborn over. And I called his dad, what time of the day can I go out there? Because it was raining a little bit, it was early in the morning. Said, go anytime you want. But I'm going to tell you this one thing. I'm going to warn you one time. You listen close, because I'm not going to tell you the second time. Don't you take anything out there bad with you. I went out there. For the first time in my life, I went through that rock. Pull the tops tighter. Right here? Yeah, pull the tops tighter. Right here, this used to be the sun. You like the sun? What you destroyed? You see what you guys are doing? Bunch of idiots. The money, follow the money, but we're going to be together. We'll be together one of these days. What you destroy here will never be replaced. With the history of the migrations and lives of Native peoples preserved in their oral and written libraries, on the ground, in geoglyphs, trails, and cultural sites, we can understand how humans adapted to global warming following the last ice age. I began to see how in a desperate search for solutions, we would decimate the historical record of what solutions had worked in the past. Yeah, it's not every day that you get people like us on there. We're going to be on TV. we going to be on TV all over. No joke. So you want to make a comment, right now's the time. I know who you represent. And I had to work that afternoon in Laughlin, Nevada. But as I left the area, I had to go to work. Driving on the freeway, I felt that stress going out of my body. I felt that anger go out of me, that hate go out of me. That's what these places are about, a rock. Rock speak to you, we're saying. Got a helicopter coming out. Hey, better call some more in. <laughs> as long as we look at climate change through the lens of something that fits the investor-owned utility business model, we can pull together the constituency to do a few projects. And while we argue and, and go through all of the twists and turns necessary to move these projects forward, the Germans are methodically putting in 500 megawatts a month on rooftops, on parking lots and little arrays on the ground. I mean, they're showing us how to do it. And we're sitting here with our arms crossed, saying because we've got the big desert, we're going to focus on that 
And really the desert has become our Achilles heel. GPSing where they are, putting them on my maps, and then looking at the BLM documentation that outlines the project area. It looks to me like Cocopelli is not in the project area, but not by very much. It's right on the border. However, the Temple to the Underworld is in one of the sections named in the section list in the BLM documentation that is inside the project area. And there's a couple more sites right next to the temple, uh, to the underworld, and those also are inside the, the bomb. So those are in extreme danger. Well, we call this place where we're at the temple. It's, uh, we call it the temple because instead of being like a, you know, a pyramid, it's a pyramid down. Everything is up and everything is down. So right here we have, we have uh, a 16, 16 uh, levels, 16 lines that represent levels. And seven are on the top and nine are going down straight to that mountain over there and you can see his face. His name is Texcalipoca. And in the, and in the, in the topo map, it's called El Tosco. El Tosco means the hefty, hefty is like this. That's why he's the one that's over here, a geoglyph over here, that descends from that mountain over there. That far mountain is called Tamoan Chan. If you saw the, the the movie of Avatar, the Avatar movie was representing that mountain over there, Tamoan Chan. It's what we say, where sky meets earth. Unless you got water in your brain. Coco Pini! Coco Pini! Jesus Christ was real. He was real. He is in history. If you look way back, the man did exist. He did do those things. And they did kill him. It's true. That's, it's there. So, but he said he was the son of God. So that's what everybody gets pissed off about because he was the son of God. But I think we're all the son of God. We're all the son of the creator. To me, I'm the son of Kumar too because I come from him when he started a long time ago. There are some more than others who follow it more, but there's things like that that people don't seem to realize. First thing, just a little bit about our company. Our company specializes in what are called power towers, concentrating solar energy. Uh, we design, develop, and deploy, build, own, operate uh, solar power towers, uh, generating renewable energy. Really what we generate is we generate steam. We said no. When is it going to get through your head? You know, do we have to buy you for a billion dollars for violating one of our cremation sites? Or ten billion dollars? I think that's a pretty number. You know, uh, do we have to go to court to do that? To, in order, that's the only only thing you understand is the money. And so you violated. We told you, and so maybe ten billion dollars you would understand. Governor Schwarzenegger of the greatest state in the country, California. I just came back from China they were bragging about that they have the biggest solar plant. And it's true, but now after we build this one, this will become the biggest solar plant in the world. It will power 170,000 homes. So this is, I mean, this is a win-win. And this is why I always say, there's some people that look out in the desert and they see miles and miles of emptiness. I see miles and miles of a gold mine. Who's making money here? Huh? Somebody's making money and you know they have to regenerate that power before it gets to the big city. You know I always say well hey there's rooftops over there, they have sun over there. And then out of the blue the cost of doing these photovoltaic panels on the roof or on the ground drops precipitously. Why us? Because uh, we went all this through the centuries is uh, Always put it near a native people and you won't get no opposition, you know, because we won't say nothing. But this time, no, I think we've taken enough. Suddenly, 
That's a lower cost way to do business. Yet the constituencies have built around the big and remote model. Isn't it great that the big environmental organizations and the utilities can lock arms on a strategy? It just happens to be a very high impact strategy. The other controversy, of course, is the reason why I'm here and part of the reason why many of, uh, of you are here, which is the fact that uh, to the extent that we're doing large-scale renewable projects in the desert, that's also causing some significant harm. It's causing uh, a destruction of uh, uh, cultural values that have been in existence for, for uh, hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, it destroys biological values that have, have been here since uh, for even longer. Um, and it threatens uh, our ability to create a more decentralized, distributed energy structure that is uh, what I think many of us believe is the, the ultimate end goal. In elementary school, we studied California's native peoples, the gold rush, and the damming of rivers for power. The miners cried, Eureka! And happy Indians tilled the fields of the missions. Today, that story rings as hollow as the concrete dinosaurs along Highway 10. My mainstream education had omitted the inconvenient truth of genocide. The genocide of tribal ways, tribal beliefs, tribal religion, they've done enough genocide work already. Now they're gonna, they want to do that to completely wipe us off the face of the earth and spiritual also. Like we're talking about out here, you put these uh, panels out here. I don't care if it's even not on a culture site, but they start erasing our history about our people, where they live and how they live. They start erasing everything. And it's hard to pass off once it's gone to the next generation of our people because you can't point out well, maybe you could say that was there. But when it was there, a lot of times, if somebody says it was there to me, I could probably lose interest because it was. It's not there. You start losing that. Then I won't probably pass it off to the next person in the family because it was. It's not there no more. And this is how we start losing everything. So, so when you said when they build the solar plants here, they're taking away your culture. I mean, do you they're see this? They're not taking it away. They're destroying it. They're destroying a past. They're destroying your culture. Just like I went over there and took your driver's license and took your birth certificate and took everything that you had and took your camera and kicked you out going down the road. You have no past, no nothing. The only thing you got is your memory. That's all we have is our memory after they do that. Nation. 
There's other ways to tell the story, but when you look at the world, we always think of a of a matter. We think we think of a, atoms. When the world started, I think uh, it says that in our tribe believes that it was a, there was two beings that uh, came out of the water. It says, but I think there's something beyond that too. How it started, but up to that point, all it's saying is that there's two energies that came out that positive and negative came out, they came together and they created the world. And the world is made up like that. This here, for instance, all of this skin or all this being is uh, energy. The whole world was started from energy. That's in the tribal belief that it was energy was from fire. This flesh might go, but our energy that started this thing is going to go on. That belief is true because energy never died. Now, even uh, Einstein said that. Energy never died. And this is what we believe. This is our energy. Our energy within me never dies. So I might go, but the, my energy goes on. And every human being, you, you, every one of us, our energy goes on. Now, that is the belief. Now, I don't have to get a Bible to tell you that, and you don't need a Bible to know that. So it means there is a time when this whole thing will be gone, but our energy will go somewhere else. And it'll come, we'll keep going.